Barbara, we're here to talk about Master of His Fate, which yes. is your new book and which launches a new Victorian series, um, another epic family saga that starts with a Barrow boy <coughs> and the poverty of London, uh, but also the wealth of the of the ruling classes. Um, and I was absolutely captivated by Victorian times, and I wondered what it was that caught your interest in the first place. What do you think is the pull of that era? Well, it wasn't really a, a pull to the era because people, well, I'll start a little story. I'll make it very quick. Every journalist says, where do you get your ideas? And I really don't know. But what happens, and it happened with a woman of substance, one day I'd been struggling to write a novel and got maybe 100 pages or 90 pages, and I did that five times and never finished those books. And then one day, suddenly in my head, when I was, I was a journalist when I, and I worked from home. I, I, did a, I did a column that was syndicated. Suddenly, when I was doing the, this piece I was writing, there was a girl in my head, a little girl walking across the moor. And I thought, what's this? And I thought, oh, she's going to a big house. She's a servant. And I, I just stopped myself thinking, did the column I was writing, and then put another piece of paper in the typewriter and I've said what I've just said to you. A little girl walking across the moors. Who is she? Well, she's a servant in a large house, and she's going to make it in the outside world. This, and I thought, oh, it's in Yorkshire. Better write about Yorkshire. You're a Yorkshire woman. You know what makes them tick. And then I typed, she is a woman who, a girl who becomes a woman of substance. And I thought that's a great title. Mm -hmm. So I didn't think of the era or anything, but yeah. I knew I had to set it in the past and bring it forward to modern times. With Master of His Fate, a similar thing happened. I was working on the Cavendon Luck, the third book in that series, and I stopped working for the day at four o'clock in the afternoon, and I sat down with a cup of tea and thinking of nothing really, and there was a boy. I thought, oh, who's this little boy with a barrow pushing it up a hill? And that really is how it happens. Somebody pops into my head, I don't know from where, and within half an hour, I knew it was a little boy who worked with his father on a market stall and wanted to become a great merchant prince. But I, I, I didn't stop working at that day. I wrote a lot of notes about the boy. I didn't yes. even have a name for him. And then I thought, but when is this going to be? What period of time should it be? It seemed really possible for it to happen at that time yeah. in, 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 in our history. And I remembered, as I was writing the notes, that Fortnum and Mason was open in yeah. 18, no, in, in 1770s, it was opened. So I thought, well, Victorian times. Mm, you've got but a, there, to draw on. a lot to draw on, and I also remembered that it was a very strange time in the sense that we were, at that time, the greatest nation in the world. We were the richest nation in the world, and yet it was the aristocracy who owned the land, so therefore owned the country and controlled the country, and then the gentry and a sort of beginning of a, an upper middle class of professionals, and then great poverty. And I thought, I wonder why that was. And all of these thoughts about Victorian England came to me over a number of days, not at that very moment. And I decided to research Victorian England, and I read a wonderful biography of Dickens, because I thought, how, how will I know the streets? Um, was there a Half Moon Street? Was there a Grosvenor Square? Um, 
I realized I knew nothing really about Victorian times. The only thing I knew is that human nature does not change. So all of us sitting here are exactly like the Victorians. We're just wearing different clothes. Uh, we're, we're like the Romans, but wearing different clothes because we have the same emotions. We have the anger, the jealousy, the love, every feeling we have as human beings, they all had before us in different You're times. So, right. yeah. so aside from the fact that I knew Victorians were like us because they were human beings and we haven't changed over the centuries, I mean, we haven't been given a new gene to make us different, I, I then realized I needed facts. I needed the names of streets. Yeah. Uh, I needed to know about uh, markets because I was putting him in a market. And I really, in the end, invented a market because I wanted one with a roof, like the one in Leeds, where my mother used to take me. And it had a wall, it had walls and a roof and it was locked up at night. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I couldn't find one like that. And I therefore invented it. Because it's office. fiction, yes. yes. Exactly. So the Malvern Market became his workplace. And um, very slowly, the research took a lot of time because I read, when I'm researching I have a period, I really like to write about, the, read about the people in it. It's more interesting mm -hmm. to me to, re to read yes. about a person than just read about a period of time. Yes. So. I read the Dickens book, yes. um, and I read, I think that was by Kate, was Claire, Claire Tomalin, yes. and it was interesting, and I read A.N. Wilson's Victoria, yes. and I read a book about the Prince of Wales who became King Edward VII. Mm. And I, but I then knew I had to, when I finished, when I finished, I knew I'd have to start writing, because if you spend too much time researching, we never get the book written. So yes, yes. so um, it was an adventure in a way because I discovered that they were really like us. Uh, you know, we always think of them as being prudish yes. and not sexy, but oh yes, they were very sexy. <laughs> and, and they did everything we do today, yes. you know, yes. uh, that people do today. Maybe not us in this room, but people. Yes. Like adultery and anger and jealousy and murder and politics. It's all the same. It's all, there. It's all, it's all there. the same. And I know I mean, you're a huge Dickens fan, and I know you said that you were in some ways shocked that when you thought, when you reread some Dickens, and then compared to what you were finding out, it was he he wasn't making it up. He was like a reporter. It really was as bad as he made it in the books. I mean, the poverty was incredible. I mean, people in England went to bed, the average person, with empty bellies every night, and yet here we were, the greatest nation yes. in the world. And nobody paid a, up there in the establishment paid any attention to the poverty, to the slums, to the filth, to the... Yes. London was filthy, and the slums were terrible. And it was extraordinary yes. that, well, in my book, of course, uh, the new one, we have a woman who does see one thing, and that is the abuse of women by violent husbands. And she does something about that by creating a safe house. But it really was two different worlds, in a sense, yes. the rich and the poor. Yes. It was that simple. But they were very, very poor. The average person living in a slum with maybe a man making nothing a week, a uh, few shillings a week, their stable food was bread and water. Now, some were able to afford beer, and that was considered good because it had nutrients mm -hmm. in it, yes, you know. The but they didn't water. have a lot of food. They yes. were very thin. They were terrified of water, and that was all classes. They thought, oh, we can't get washed mm -hmm. because it opens our pores. So a lot of them washed their face and then had nice clean towels and they wiped their bodies every day. It's amazing yes, it's that, you know, and in one of the books I read, Queen Victoria, apparently, if, if it's true, I don't know, said to Lord Melbourne, who 
was the prime minister when she became queen. And, and she was rather, he was very good looking and yeah. an older man. She had a bit of a crush on him, actually. And she said, oh, I do love my boss at night, Lord Melbourne. Don't you? And he said, I never bathe. <laughs> <laughs> and when I read that at the time, I thought that can't be. But I found a book called How to Be a Victorian or it might have been how to live like a Victorian. And a young, it came out about four or five years ago and I found this as a paperback and bought it immediately. And this young woman, a, a journalist and a writer, decided she would research Victorian times and then live for one year as a Victorian. And this is when I yeah. found out about all these cotton um, towels, yeah. really, that people wiped, and she said, I never smelt. I lived for a year without a bath, well, and I never smelt. Tips for hygiene. <laughs> yeah. Now, but now it, perhaps it was the same in Elizabethan times, yeah. because do you remember, they always had those oranges with the yeah. clothes, pom yeah. pomaders, pomanders, yeah. commanders. Um, so anyway, so the things I found out really they do. They fill the book with color. I think. And well, make it fascinating. Yes. I mean, I used everything that I found. Yes. Because it was true. And what I think you've done also really well is because Jimmy or James comes from a poorer family. We've got the different strata of society in there. Um, they're not living in the slums, but um, he comes from a working class family, and his grandparents are in service. And I think that a lot of the early reviews have loved the fact that you're writing the epic family saga, a genre that you're so well known for. What is it about family and family sagas that draws you back and makes them so appealing to your readers, do you think? I think the most dangerous place in the world is to be in the middle of a large family. <laughs> You've got free-floating emotion with m many people sometimes, but let's say a couple marry and they have four or five children because they did have a lot of children in those days. And those children grow up and get married and have spouses and then come along grandchildren. And there are cousins and aunts and uncles who are full of emotions, anger, jealousy, love, hate, jealousy, a lot of, yeah. greed. You think of all of the things that we're filled with, and then you've like maybe 18 people in a family. You can have a war. Yeah. You know, yes. Yes. And, and blood and ties, and yeah. as you say, marriage ties, and where the blood is thicker than water. Yes, and, and I don't know that blood is thicker than water, especially in a family where there might be great stakes, yeah. where there might be a lot of money. Yeah. I think that they, you. Some people who are not very nice might forget all about being the, of the same blood. Yes. They just want the money or the power. Yes. But it's a fa it was a fascinating era that I hadn't realized was fascinating because I'd always skipped it. I'd always thought, oh, it, it's boring and they yes. were prudish yes. and they never, they didn't talk about sex and uh, blah, blah, blah. The one thing that I, did find with when I read the first Dickens book by Claire Tomalin, it reminded me, as I read along, what a man's world it was. Well, it's still a man's world, actually, if you want the truth, but uh, we've only got to look around Parliament, don't we? All those knives out at the moment. Anyway, um, it, is, it was a man's world to the nth degree in Victorian England, I believe, from what I've read and thought about, is that they really look down on women in a certain sense. Women really weren't clever enough to be their friends. It really comes with great impact to you in that particular Dickens biography, because he was always doing this with yeah. lots of other men who had wives and children, and they were just yeah, left to get home. on with it. Yeah clean the house, or if they have servants, run the house, bring up the children, do your knitting, and you can't go out, you know, without your husband. Yes, yes. In fact, single women of a certain class were not allowed out 
without a chaperone. It was yeah. still chaperone town. Yeah. And the other thing that sort of made me do this was in that book, How to Be a Victor or How to Live as a Victorian, the clothing that a woman wore in the mid 1800s, it was crinoline time. And so you started with a pair of what they called knickers, which was the sort of two legs joined across the middle, but there was, sorry, <laughs> a hole where there should have been the rest of the knickers. Then a little vest, and then an overskirt, and then tied round the waist, and then a hoop. Mm -hmm. The hoop was made of metal and tied round the ra waist, and it was like a bell, and you've probably seen pictures of them. Mm -hmm. and, and then over that went two more petticoats, mm -hmm. and then the corset. Mm -hmm. And the tighter, the better, because it gave you a tiny waist. Yeah. But it, in, I didn't know this, until I read the book, but th that caused a lot of ill health. Yeah. The lacing too yeah. tight. It broke ribs, yeah. People, women got sick. And then of course, over the crinoline shell or the bell went another couple of underskirts. Yeah. And then after, after the corset, I think there was little, um, like a garter belt for for the stockings, yeah. and then then the dress. Now, how can anybody go and have an affair one afternoon? <laughs> you can't, you can't, because who's going to get you? You have to take the maid, <laughs> because somebody has got to get you out of those clothes and back into them. And that is what, and I think that is why, especially in the aristocracy, they invented the weekend in the country yeah. because. And they could put a man and his mistress in the same house and nobody knew what happened when the lights went out. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking of the aristocracy, a biographer uncovered a possible scandal which, if true uh, in your own past, would make you the granddaughter of a marquis. And do you think that that lies behind the, the pull that you felt to write about the aristocracy or about stately homes? Well, I, I'd written a lot of books before I had this revelation. Um, uh, just as a funny aside, the writer decided <clears throat> to send the manuscript to me uh, to arrive on my birthday. Um, a very misguided decision on his part, misguided because it. when I got it, I couldn't. It did come on my birthday. <laughs> I started to read it and quickly came across a lot of stuff I didn't know. And I got very upset. And when Bob came home, I, he said, what is it? He knew immediately. So I told him I'm very upset by this stuff that Piers seems to have dug up. And I'm not going to have it in the book. So I explained some of it. And he said, well, I can't hear anymore. And you've got to get ready because it's your birthday and we're going, we've invited people to dinner. So when I called, the, so I did, I mean, I'm a grown up. So I realized I had control of the book because not only were my publishers publishing it, I had right of approval. So the manuscript went on the desk and we had my birthday dinner. But when I called, I got up very early. We, I was in New York. I got a, a five hours difference, you know got up quite early and called him. Oh, Barbara, he said, did you get the man manuscript? And I said, thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, you're upset. I said, I think that's the understatement of the year. He said, my wife told me you'd be upset. <clears throat> and I should have listened. I said, you should. Anyway, the whole point is that I was going to Paris and he wanted, well, he was asked me if I was coming to London because he wanted to show me a lot of genuine documents. Mm. And I said, well, I want to see them and I'm not giving my approval of this book until you prove to me mm. that there's possible truth in, in this, in saying that my mother is illegitimate. And it wasn't you, but it was yeah. Patricia and she, my, edit, my other editor before Lynn, um, 
said to me, but Barbara, it, it all happened a hundred years ago. Why does it matter? I said, because my mother wouldn't like it yeah. that it all of this stuff, if it's true, came out. And she sort of, I wasn't with her, I was on the phone, but I could see her probably saying, yeah, her mother wouldn't like it, her mother's dead. Um, anyway, to cut to the chase, I did, he did come to see us in Paris and he did bring a lot of documentation which was quite uh, startling to me and also influenced me in the sense that I didn't have it cut out because my husband said, well, it's a much better story. <laughs> I said, what? He said, if you take that out, there's not much. I said, thanks, thanks a lot, Bob. But, um, so did it influence me? I can't say it did, because I had written A Woman of Substance and other books. Now, the author, Piers, Piers Dudgeon, yeah. insists that somehow I knew a lot of this that I might have heard as a child and had yeah. it had gone I mean, into my unconscious memory. Your mother had taken you to... Well, I was just yeah. starting to, yeah. to say this. What I think influenced me to write eventually A Woman of Substance and then a lot of, of sequels <laughs> to A Woman of Substance and, and also the other sagas. Yeah. I've, written modern, I've written other books than sagas, uh, but going to the sagas, I believe that what influenced me was her taking me to so many stately homes in Yorkshire and um, saying that's a Gainsborough, that's a Lely, that is a piece of Chippendale. And we went to places just outside Leeds, like uh, Temple Museum yeah. and Newby Hall and places in Ripon. And of course, she always went back to Ripon and mm -hmm. took me with her. She came from Ripon and took me always to Fountains Hall and Fountains Abbey. And she always said, because I said, why do you like this place so much, Mummy? And she said, well, I grew up here. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things that he dug up, I mean, my grandmother always lived in a house owned by the Marquis of Ribbon, and I don't know what anybody else would make of it, but I thought it was odd. Yeah. I mean, yeah. why always in one of his houses? Yeah. So whether it's true or not, I don't know, but what my mother's, what my mother did was shove me into a world of culture and history in a way, and yeah. stately homes, art, yeah. the furniture, but I didn't think I was being force fed. I loved it. I loved that she read to me and she taught me to mm -hmm. read and that I read every book of Dickens before I was 12. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> I think it's been such a privilege and, and uh, an honour to hear those little insights into your world and your past and how you came to be so successful. Um, so thank you very, very much. We all want to just applaud everything you've achieved. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you.